accident, or really bad construction. So I made it to Midway Airport with about a half an hour to spare. <laughs> so I run, I, I get my bags checked because this doesn't happen by accident. <laughs> it requires some planning and some stuff. So I get my bags checked in, and I happen to know the guy, because I, I fly Southwest on a pretty regular basis, and I happen to know this guy. So I flip him an extra, some extra change, and I say, please. And he says, I'll do my best. Thank you. I take off for security. I am grateful there's no line. Go figure. That's because everybody's still on the road in construction. <laughs> So I run through security and you take, get naked, right? Out of got naked up here, I had to get naked for security. So you get naked and then you have to put all your stuff back on and I take off because my gate is not gate two, it's gate 32, all the way at the end of the B terminal in Midway. So I leave my shoes off and I take off. I make it, I sit down in the bulkhead, <sighs> sweating, and I go to text my family. No phone. Going through my stuff, right? And the flight attendant, I'm starting to cry, right? I just made it. And you, you, know, talk, you know the cortisol level that John Minardi talked about yesterday? Yeah, mine, I have two brain tumors compared to him because my cortisol was off the chart. So <laughs> I'm, I'm digging through my stuff, and, and the flight attendant sees that I am clearly upset. And she says, how can I help you? And I said, I can't find my phone. And she goes, well, where'd you leave it? And you're like, really? <laughs> If I knew where it was, I wouldn't be panicked. I said, well, honestly, the only place I stopped was security. Can I please go get my phone? And she says, of course. <sighs> OK. So I walk back down the jet jetway. And I, there's another flight attendant there, or agent. And she says, you can't go get your phone. And I said, well, why not? And she says, well, if I close the door before you get back, you can't get on the plane. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, just don't close the door until I get back. But I don't think things work like that. So I'm like, OK, so I truck back up the jetway. And I get on, back on the plane. And my flight attendant that I had just talked to, who gave me permission to get my phone, was standing there. And she says, oh, what happened? And I said, oh, they won't let me go get the phone because of the door, blah, blah. And about that moment, and now I'm really crying. I'm like, <sighs> right? The captain of the plane turns around. And he says, what's the matter? And he puts his hand on my shoulder. And I said, well, I was kind of in a rush and construction, and I don't have my phone. And, and I don't, I, I take security, and I couldn't go get it, and I'm flustered, right? And he goes, don't worry about it. OK. And he goes, I'll go get it. And I said, no, 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 you can't, you know. No, you can't do that. And he goes, of course I can. The plane can't leave without me. <laughs> so long story short, really, so he goes, he gets my phone, he comes back with a plastic baggie. You know what else was in there? My photo ID. I was going nowhere fast. So to me, yes, it was a crisis moment, and, but they didn't have to act like that at all, did they? That captain could have just said, well, I'm sorry, we'll help you on the other end. I'm sorry, we can't do anything about it. I mean, there was a lot of different answers that could have happened, right? But for me, how, how much does that make me want to fly Southwest? And who am I telling about Southwest? Everybody. Now, I realize everybody kind of has their opinions, but to me, that was awesome. About four months ago, now it's been longer than that, sorry, about a year ago, a new natural pet store opened right next to Trader Joe's. Now, if you're like, I'm a single mom, so I'm busy, so if I can find something that's in the same shopping center, that makes my life easier, right? Convenience. So I walk in thinking, OK, I got I to gotta get you know, gluten-free, dairy-free, egg-free, everything for your dog, just like yourself, right? So I go in there, and the way they're set up is their checkout station, which is not a lane, it's a station, it's like a beautiful front desk, is right at the beginning of the store. And there's people, you know, the, the manager comes out from behind the desk and says, hi, how are you? And I said, well, hi. He goes, have you been in our store before? And I said, yes. Or, I said, no, I haven't. And he says, well, what's your name? And I told him my name. And he tells me, tell me about your dogs. What do you have? Do you need help? 
And I said, well, I have this old dog. And long story short, two weeks later, I went in, and he says, oh, hi, you're the chiropractor, Chris. And he knew my dog. He knew our situation. He knew everything. Amazing, right? That's extraordinary customer service. He walked me through the store. The cat stuff is over here. The dog stuff. These are the treats. This is the frozen stuff. Have you ever tried this? Have you? I walked out of there with a bag of samples <sighs> for my little old dog. That's, that's exceptional service. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're also going to talk about chiropractic as a commodity. And again, we've talked a little bit about that today. And that's just a negative spiral to mediocrity. We're going to talk about the patient X, or the patient experience, and, and kind of the overarching principles of what you need in your office. I'll give you a few specifics, but you have to tailor this and be very aware of who your patient population is, right? Dr. Jennifer said that the other day, right? She said, tailor it to you. And, and Jenna Davis said it as well. Your patients are your patients. Whether you attract the businessmen in their $500 custom shirts with a monogram on the sleeve, if you don't have a hanger for those shirts, what happens when they lay face down on your table? What do those shirts look like? Right? Offer them a shirt or a place to hang their shirt and give them a t-shirt. What does that say to them? We respect who you are and the fact that you came in before you went to work to get adjusted. And we want you looking your best. Anticipating their needs, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a brand new book out by Bruce Loeffler and Brian Church that goes through a bunch of steps the way Disney does it. It's called The Experience. And who creates an experience besides Disney, right? Think about your carnival your local carnival versus your Disney experience. <laughs> a little different, right? <laughs> so that's what we're going we're gonna to take some of our material from that. That being said, it's a little bit more than paint on a wall. It's a little bit more than some funky flowers that you probably don't even know the name of on your front desk. It's about creating a climate in your office for communication. And it's actually a thing. The communication climate is a thing in communications. It's something that we teach. It's something that's taught in communications all the time. What is the climate that you set up? Is it friendly? Is it warm, welcoming? Does it cater to who your patient visits are? You want to have a spa, that's great. But if you are catering to the mom with five kids, she's going to feel uncomfortable, like something might get messed up. Right? She doesn't want to bring her kids to that. So it has to be friendly for who your patient population is. So we're going to roll a little video. We're going to talk about some research. The research says that 89% of your patients or customers are going away after a poor experience. They're gone. And we learned today, I think 4% are only going to tell you that why. Only 4% are going to tell you why. And here's the bigger one, right? 26% of them are going to throw it up on Facebook. Nice. So all the Facebook stuff that we're trying to do, that we just heard about earlier today, and then here comes the right? Trying to create all this goodwill. Here's the other piece is 37% of you don't even include it as a budget item line when you're thinking about how much money you're spending in marketing. You don't even think about creating an experience in your office or putting any money towards it. So we get flowers on Mother's Day and Easter and Thanksgiving and probably a couple others. My team is down here so they, they can tell you more. And we hand out roses, not just flowers, roses. Costco has them very inexpensively, and if you order them ahead, they're even cheaper. We give out roses on Mother's Day, and let me tell you, when that 85-year-old woman came in who had not had a rose since her husband died, she had tears. 
And it never even occurred to me that we might be doing something for somebody that they haven't had done forever, or maybe never. So this is an easy, simple, sweet way to do things. Now, I'm from the Midwest for the most part, so that's kind of how we are. <laughs> Some of it's just ingrained, and I'm going to talk about my mom at the end. I am a third-generation customer experience creator. <laughs> so I think we have the Express piece of video. Express a passionate commitment to serving the customer. Customer service starts at the top, and it certainly does in the case of Virgin America. Both Branson and Virgin America CEO David Cush believe that a superior customer experience is the key ingredient to success in a competitive global economy, regardless of the type of business you're in. Yeah, uh, look, anybody, anybody can, can sell a cup of coffee, anybody can uh, buy a physical airplane, um, and, uh, and we all buy the planes from the same manufacturers, so Boeing or Airbus, so, um, but, you know, but you know, th th they're the different stops, I mean, it, uh, you know, if you fly on, fly on a Virgin plane, you know, whether it's Virgin Atlantic, Virgin America, Virgin Australia, you know you're going to have... Uh, a completely different experience than if you what is the difference the the differentiation between Virgin America and all of these other domestic airlines that we see here and I know it's more than it's more than the in-flight uh, entertainment I know it's more than the Wi-Fi I think in my opinion it's got to be the customer service am I wrong uh, everything in the end uh, comes down to uh, customer service and the people who are serving you and whether they're proud of the company, uh, and you know the, 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 the only way that you can actually have people working on a, in, in a company uh, that are proud of it is if you give them give them the tools, give them every little detail. So who are you, doctors? Who are you? Are you the commodity, the generic brand chiropractor? We talked about that, right? Do you even remember remember the generic brand cans? Do you remember that? Are you that? Like just a label with a name? Do you have a good brand? Do you have a great logo? When was the last time you updated your logo? We talked a little bit about that this morning as well. Are you a commodity? Now a commodity, in my definition, is one where price is the only differentiating factor. So you open up your mail over the trash can, as we all learned from Dr. Powers this morning. We open the mail and we find a coupon for $19.99 for an oil change. And then we keep going and we find one for $15.99. Is this who we are? Is this what we've become? Because really, what's to become of us? Because that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> that so doesn't work. Mediocrity is self-imposed. Mediocrity is self-imposed and genius is our birthright. And I want to give a little bit of credit for most of my cartoons that I have today are from really an amazing cartoonist named Hugh McLeod who has a daily cartoon. And they're generally inspiring. And he worked for Seth Godin, who if you, have, if you haven't read anything by Seth Godin, you need to go do that too, because that's his marketing genius. And headspace genius. I mean, he hits both sides. <laughs> when you read him every morning. And so does Hugh McLeod. So mediocrity sucks. We don't want to be there. So here's the coolest news of the day. 89% of the customers out there will pay more for a better experience. 89%. That works for me. How does that work for you? Wouldn't you like to bump up your adjustment rates from 50 to 55? If our bare minimum is supposed to be 50? Yeah, that sounds good to me. So where are your hearts, doctors? Loving service, our first technique. Right? This is where we are. It's where we need to stay, in our heart, and in our values. And we've already talked about heart and values this weekend. I'm not going to go into that. That's not part of what I'm going to do. But I'm going to remind you that it needs to be in your mission and vision statement. 
It needs to be a part of who you are and who you're becoming as a doctor because it forces you to grow and it forces you to shift and change. And I put up a couple websites up there. The valuecenter.com is like the fastest values assessment ever. I mean, less than 10 minutes, not even. It's so quick. And there's a million articles about how to write a great mission vision statement in three steps or less or five steps. So we can do that, right? Developing this compassion for people greater than the compunction to survive. The compassion to serve outweighs any of your concerns. Because the minute you get in that headspace and that heart space, that's when you shine and your patients know it. Your patients know when you're having a bad day, you don't want to admit it, but they know. So stay in that space so that you can create an experience for them every day. This goes beyond the transaction, right? Mrs. Jones, that's $20 for your copay. Thank you very much. Do you need a receipt for that? It's a little better than that, right? It's got to be better than that. First of all, how about if your copays are done once a week on Monday before the patient comes in for three times that week? What does that do for your cash flow on Monday? Not bad, huh? So this has to go beyond just that because that's more convenient and they don't have to think about their wallet when they come in. That's part of the experience because they don't have to think about their wallet every time they walk in the door, right? So go beyond. Ritz Carlton says, uh, radar on, antenna up, which is why I picked this cartoon. <laughs> what do you see? What I saw at lunch was a really long line out at the little, uh, like the coffee shop, really long, and one person at lunch hour. I felt bad for her. And I called the Hyatt Regency and hit zero. Yes, I did, and said, hi, I'm standing in a really long line. I'm staying at your hotel, and there's no one to help this poor girl. <gasps> oh, my gosh, we'll, we'll get right on it. Didn't take long for another girl to show up. Not bad. Maybe a little, you know, a little reactive instead of proactive, but it could have been a disaster for that girl because they were lining up. We were getting 50 people in that line. Could have been a disaster. So we're going to talk about I care. I care, five principles of Disney service and relationship excellence. I impression. C connection. A attitude, because we all have one. Right? R respond or response. And E is the exceptionals. And E we're going to talk about in terms of time of uh, sorry, team building. So let's move forward. What is our first impression when you walk in the door of your office? What is it? Doctors, have you actually looked, or are you like me when you come in? Okay, who's first? What's going on? Team meeting, let's go. Who's up? What's going on? Is that you when you walk in the door? Sometimes it's me. Okay, my team will probably tell you a lot more than often. <laughs> I just dropped everybody at school. Everybody has their lunch. We're good, right? What's, so you don't even know what your front office looks like because you just barreled through it almost every day. How long has it been since you sat in your reception area? I was at my Acura dealership the other day and I was sitting, waiting. They're, they have customer service awards everywhere. And I watched one of the salespeople walk through, straighten up the magazines, fill up the little coffee thing. There's a, behind a big glass door, there's a kid's area. And those chairs were just a little askew. He went in and tidied them all up. Now, maybe he has his own compulsions or whatever. <laughs> but still, if he felt like that was his responsibility, he's just a sales guy. He's supposed to be out selling cars. But he knows that if he's going to sell a car to me, when I come in to bring mine back for service, I don't want a mess. So what is your, what, you know, how is that climate for communication? What is your first impression? Does it engage the patients? So in our office, we have a hydroponic garden that's about six foot tall. It's round and it grows things all the time. 
Jody has taken it on. It is her baby. She tends to it. It always looks amazing. And let me tell you something else. What sense of your five senses, doctors, is the most, one of the most emotional senses? Smell. Have you sniffed your office? Ew. I know when we sniff our office, it's good, because most of the time we're picking basil or something off of that. How about a little bit of grapefruit in the middle of December in the polar vortex of, of us? <laughs> Right? How bright does that make a patient feel? They don't even know why. They walk in like, oh, it feels happy in here. And they don't know why. But every time they come in, they feel happy. That's part of our first impression. Connection. Look at this poor little guy. Reach out to me. Where do you connect to your patients? Where's the first place you connect to your patients? Phone? What about your website? Is it friendly? Mine has videos all over it. And you know what I know what? None of them are perfect. None of them are perfect. I sat down with my computer on a bright sunny day in my family room and decided I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to plow out some video. I have a Mac, it works great, right? I just, great customer service, great, great product. So I sat down in front of my Mac and I just plowed through some videos and I just said, like I stand up here and talk from my heart, I sat there and just said, hey, welcome to my office. This is Restore Healing Center, this is what we do. This is how, you know, and then I would do one on massage and I did one on chiropractic and I did one on our functional medicine, I did one on losing weight. I did a whole bunch of them and I had my webmaster throw them up where they belonged in the website approachable. They know who I am, and if they don't like me ahead of time, then they're not going to come in. That's awesome, right? It pre-selects. Attitude. It's a choice, right? Our attitude is our choice. We create our attitude, and our attitude creates our patience. We bring happiness. If we bring happiness, it's really hard to have a really bad experience in our office. I know, Mrs. Jones, yeah, you have two copays. I know, but, and she's crabby. I understand. Let's see where, they, where that happened. I know I paid last time. It's okay. Let's figure this out, right? And that brings me to response. How are we responding to our patients? We bring a yes attitude in. And we want to help them. Restore Healing Center, I can help you. Not what are you doing or how, what do you want, <laughs> right? Restore Healing Center, I can help you. That's a response to the patient. That's their touch points. That's connection. That's communicating our warmth and love. So our responding to that patient who's crabby about two copays, we say, oh, look, Mrs. Jones, Remember last week when you were in, Janie had to leave early and we missed getting your copay, our bad. Totally takes her down. She's like, oh, oh, okay. Instead of, you owe it. Which you, we've all experienced that, right? We've all experienced it. So the minute you learn how to give and come from a place of empathy and compassion, that creates an extraordinary experience for your patients. So one of the things that also creates response is anticipating needs. So I've been thinking about this, and frankly, I think this is the first time my team may, may be hearing this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had this great idea. So in the winter, patients hate to bring in their slushy boots and stuff, and they really hate to get it on the bottom of your table. And we have wood floors, so it gets trapped everywhere, and it's just a mess, right? So some is a little bit selfish, but I decided I think we need like a little pad people can take off their boots and put on a pair of black socks. Right, black because they don't get dirty. You don't have to pair them. They can just be in a clean box called socks, a box of socks. And they can take them off and put their boots on. They can go in the dirty box of socks. But patients will feel more comfortable in my office and I've anticipated a need. And they need that. 
the exceptionals. The E part of this is creating the team that can absolutely be there for your patients. And how do we do that? This is very, very, this is the key to all of it, is creating a team that has the same passion that you do for your patients. It creates ownership. And when, the, when your team can act like you, the owner, you got it made. You got it made. And we're going to talk about picking team in just a minute. Companies, is customer service really the differentiator moving forward? Uh, look, I, I, I think that... I mean, if, if no, right, let's give you an example. When we started Virgin Atlantic 30 years ago, we had one 747 competing with airlines that had three, an average of 300 planes each. Every single one of those you know, airlines have gone bankrupt um, because they didn't have customer service. Um, you know, they had, they had might, but they didn't have customer service. So uh, customer service is everything in the end. Lesson number four, hire people who have the Virgin attitude. Virgin America is very selective, hiring only about one out of 100 people who apply. Those who make it are competent, friendly, and committed to providing customers with a superior level of service. We look for people who are, number one, positive, uh, number two, are friendly, and just have a good outlook on life and who see things, you know, glass, glass half full people. Uh, so that's the first thing we look for, and then of course we make sure they've got the technical capabilities of mastering the job, which generally they do. And that's that's once you have that, you know that's 90% of the battle. Then I Lesson number five: empower your employees to make every experience great. Once you hire the right employees, give them the best training, then let them use their imagination and creativity to solve problems. That's right. We have to empower our team. Will my team please stand up? I know they're so embarrassed right now. They so are not this per these people, this people. This is my awesome team right here. One of them stayed behind to see patients that were not on the schedule Thursday. She saw patients yesterday and today. She was there for our patients because she's empowered to do that, and she knew that I would not be upset about that because our patients come first in all our decisions. Our patients come first. It's not about me. It's not about us. My, uh, my brand new associate was there and she saw patients for us. Who's a rock star? Oh my gosh, she's a rock star. So happy caregivers, these this frontline team is more of a caregiver than me. Like Rick Markson said, I work for them, for the most part. I work for them. During those patient hours, I work for them. They know more about the patients. Maggie told me yesterday, hey, Barb called and said her daughter died. Now Barb is about 10 years older than me. Her daughter's 30-ish. I gotta make that phone call, right? That phone call will happen right after this. They know what's happening with your patients. They know if the dog died, if their spouse died, if something happened to their kid. They know, pay attention to them. Empower them to do the job that needs to be done. Because you'll get everywhere you need with that. So to empower my 10-year-old to take a shower one day, <laughs> I told him, could you please go take a shower? And after I got the attitude, he went and took a shower. He came back down in his jammies, and I'm thinking, oh, he's so sweet. I go over to kiss the bat over his head, to kiss his head. And you know, this little kid heads, they smell so good coming out of the shower, but not this time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, buddy, did you take a shower? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Did you use soap? No, you didn't tell me to. <laughs> so I could really come, like, and I was hysterical, right? So I could come unglued, right? Oh, get back upstairs, da 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 da. So next time, instead of like coming unglued, I'm like, well, that's awesome, bud. You took a shower. <laughs> next time, let's try some soap. 
It's kind of fun. It gets bubbly. It bubbles on your head. Let's try soap. So in those moments, when you've empowered your staff, and maybe they don't wash the dishes like your spouse, maybe they don't wash your dishes the way you would, but the job gets done, go ahead and reward them anyway. Because in the moment, they use their best judgment. And if you empower them to do that, they will have more common sense than possibly you could ever have. Correct? Uh, there we go. How are we going to hire this team? How did I hire this team? What personality traits? If caring is the new hard currency, and this is what decommoditizes us, what are the personality traits we're looking for? How about some empathy? Let's put that at the top of the page. Find empathy. Find caring, compassionate, listening, empathic people that can anticipate what's happening. Innovation happens from the bottom up. I got a survey forwarded to me by one of my team members, and it was from her vet, saying, what could we do better? Take our survey. It will take you less than 90 seconds. Ask your patients what to do. Ask your patients what they need. OK? That's the best way to hire a team, hire for attitude. Create this. And you will have the most amazing experiences ever, ever in your office. You will have rewards that you can't imagine. My grandma taught my mom who taught me. Creating the experience lasts for a lifetime. Thank you.